Hi everyone, Stepan here. In this middle game video I'm going to talk about pest pawns, how to create them, how to use them and how to try to stop them. And of course you know that having a past pawn is a major strategic advantage in a game and it could often uh, be the difference between uh, winning and losing. And the side with the past pawn often creates immense pressure and puts immense pressure, immense pressure on, uh, on the opponent's position because the opponent is forced to blockade and defend against the past pawn, which basically becomes another piece. Now you are all familiar with the uh, evaluations of uh, of piece value in, in, in chess, and of course a pawn is worth 1, minor pieces are worth 3, rooks are worth 5, and queens are worth 9. However, when you have a past pawn, then his, uh, his value in increases significantly, and you could argue that a past pawn could be worth more than a minor piece, and it often is. Uh, eventually it's worth uh, 9 points, because it promotes to a queen. So having a past pawn uh, is a major asset you could have in a position. And one thing that uh, definitely helps uh, to find opportunities for, ha for, having, for having past pawns is knowing what to look for. And I'll try to divide the video into four parts, uh, four exercises which are going to show you four positions from real games in which the players manage to create a past pawn with four different ideas, ideas, and I'm also going to talk about what to do to try and prevent uh, your opponent from queening his past pawn. Okay, the first example is from a game between Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, and Wang Yui uh, from 2010, and this is the simplest example, and by the way, I, I just have to mention that this is from a King's Gambit, uh, and it was a wonderful game, you can check it out, Carlsen, Wang Yui, 2010. And here it's obvious that White has a pawn majority on the queen side, you have seen, uh, I hope, my, my video on pawn majorities. If you haven't, uh, you can check that out for more in information about these types of structures. And here, White has a simple task. Push through one of his pawns, create a past pawn. And th this will inevitably cause problems for uh, the player with the black pieces. So Magnus Carlsen here simply played the move d5. After the move d5, uh, there's no way for black to avoid white having a passed pawn. White is either going to push the pawn to d6, or after an exchange have a passed pawn on d5. So this is the simplest way and the easiest way to create a passed pawn, and it's also the simplest uh, solution to spot. Of course, if you have a pawn majority, then it's simple. You push through your pawns, you're going to have a passed pawn. Uh, as the number of pieces on the board decreases, uh, it becomes simpler to queen your pawn. So remember that if you have a pawn majority and if you create a passed pawn, any piece trades, as long as uh, your, your king is closer to the pawn, then your opponent's king will mean that you win the game. After d5, uh, his opponent played knight to f6, preventing the move d6. Now we have queen to d4, threatening d6. cd5, knight takes d5, and this was an interesting... Uh, an interesting choice because now Magnus has an even more favorable pawn uh, majority which is going to be harder for the black king to catch and uh, once he creates a passed pawn on the b file or on the a file then the passed pawn is going to be more significant so in this position uh, Wang Yui decided to trade knight takes d5 c takes d5 and here you have it the passed pawn now this was fairly simple and uh, this you need to see in your own games. When you have a pawn majority, don't just uh, push your pawns like your mental trying to create a passed pawn. Think about which uh, which file would your passed pawn be best on. Uh, in Magnus's case here, he didn't want to trade immediately after d5, uh, knight to f6, queen d4, c d5. He took with the knight because he knows that having a passed pawn somewhere here is going to be better than having a passed pawn on the d-file. The passed pawn on the d-file is e easier to blockade by black's pieces and it's easier to catch by black's king. And now after knight d5, c d5, uh, queen to d6, we, hum we come to the first point in the defense against the passed pawn. Uh, Aron Nimcovic said in his book My System and Blockade that uh, a passed pawn is a prisoner and that it should be kept under lock and key. And that's very true. If you manage to blockade your opponent's passed pawn, then it's going to be easier to stop it, of course, because it can't move. But it's also easier to round it up and to win it and uh, to trade it off if possible, or just take it. So in this position, Black's ideal uh, would be to, let's say, play rook to d8, uh, f6, bishop to f7, put pressure on the pawn, win the pawn. In order to do that, he has to stop it from moving. And Magnus Carlsen is the world champion, so he didn't really allow that. But the basic idea is correct. When you when you tried the 
the, the best idea here. Blockade the pawn and then win it afterwards. The game continues with knight to e5, uh, trying to prevent uh, this idea of f6, bishop f7, and also preparing to play knight to c4 to remove the defender, to remove the blockade. Once white plays knight to c4, then the queen has to move and the pawn is advancing to, to d6. So your goal uh, with the white pieces here is to remove the blockade. If you don't remove the blockade, uh, the pawn can't move. And you can already see that the whole game is revolving around this one d5 pawn. The material is completely equal. You could even argue that black's minor piece is, piece is superior to white's knight on e4, on e5. But the passed pawn makes all the difference and white is in fact winning here. So knight to e5, a very smart move, either going to c4 and also preventing bishop to f7. Rook to e8 pinning the knight to the rook, of course, so the knight can't move now. Rook to e3, removing the pin, and also staying on dark, dark squares, which is very important if your opponent has a light squared bishop, then you basically want to keep all of your pieces on the opposing colored complex, which Magnus Carlsen is doing here perfectly, and this means that this bishop becomes sort of uh, dampened and insignificant and unable to attack anything important. One more thing white has to do is to remove the pawn from the light square, and then it becomes safe. Rook to d8, trying to stop the pawn, and now simply knight to c4, there's nothing uh, There's nothing he can do. Of course, there's a tactical trick here, if queen takes, okay, let me just show you that, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, there's a back rank issue, so uh, black can't really win the pawn, so in this case, this worked. Rook to d8. If the move h6 had been played, then it would have been little, a little trickier, and the pawn would actually be hanging, but that's what Magnus was counting on. So knight c4, the queen has to move, queen to f6. And now rook to e5, defending the pawn once more and stopping the queen trade, which is very important. Uh, h6, d6, just advancing the pawn. And here you can see that black is in a lot of trouble. Now, here I come to my second point. Uh, once you have a passed pawn, it's uh, fairly similar to having a material advantage. You don't always count on that one advantage winning the game for you. Sometimes it could be very smart to trade one advantage for another, and that's exactly what Magnus Carlsen did in this game. He didn't queen this pawn, uh, the d-pawn never queened, uh, but he traded the advantage of the past d-pawn for something even more significant and then went on to win the game later on. Now let's see what happened. Bishop f5, preventing the pawn from moving forward. Knight to b6. Uh, bishop to e6, and now the, the the back rank issue no longer exists because the bishop is defending and the pawn is on h6. d7, moving the pawn forward, king to h8, a4, g6, queen c3, I'm just going to shuffle through the move so that you can see what happened. Here, in this position, Wang Yui uh, sacrificed the, the exchange, so takes, takes, takes here. And now... Magnus Carlsen gave up his passed pawn, but he knew that in this position he's going to win anyway. Of course, he's an exchange up. So, he found another idea here and created another passed pawn. After this, he played the amazing move g4 and whatever black does, uh, creation of a passed pawn is inevitable. And here he, he used the second point I wanted to talk about, and that's the pawn breakthrough. I'm going to give you an example game for that as well, but you can see that if you imagine... Uh, uh, the h4 pawn being a passed pawn, it's pretty hard if you don't know uh, the ideas be be behind these tactics with g4 and creating sort of a pawn tension on the board where two po two opposing pawns could be captured. And after g4, that's exactly what happened. hg4, h5, and now the win was pretty simple. And in this position, Magnus Carlsen allowed, allowed Wang Yui to queen, but Wang Yui resigned here because... Uh, he can't really do much, and he's getting checkmated here. So this was the first example. Uh, the important point I wanted to talk about is right here. After rook takes e1, c6, the move d5. c6 is an okay try, because allowing the pawn to d5 would be even uh, worse for, for black. But after d5, a simple move using a pawn majority, white is simply winning. This pawn is... Uh, too strong, and it actually becomes a material advantage, sort of, in theory, for, for white. The second example I wanted to talk about is pawn breaks, and uh, we already saw one example in the Carlsen game uh, on the flank. Here in this game, this is Sakaev versus Fedorov from the Individual European Championship 2005. This came from a King's Indian, you can see the closed pawn structure. Uh, in this game, uh, the highlighted three pawns are a pawn majority. Now, 
it's hard to picture now, but if you use uh, a pawn break, then they can become a pawn majority. And uh, in this uh, position, Sakaev played a wonderful move. He played the move f4. Now let's look at Black's options. Uh, if he takes on e4, then you can take you can take here, and you have a passed pawn. And these two pawns are just horrible. After f4, uh, his opponent actually took e f4. And now he played e5. And now if you look at this pawn majority, it actually is a pawn majority. So in this position, after queen to d7, it was hard to believe that these three pawns are ever going to move. But after the move f4, the center becomes so dynamic and uh, changes that uh, in, in white's favor and white is actually uh, able to create a pawn majority, which is going to turn into a passed pawn. So after e takes f4, e5 there's nothing better but to take on e5 and of course now if you count the material white has three four five pawns black has one two three four five six seven pawns white has sacrificed two pawns and given time black is going to utilize his pawn majority on the queen side as well however white counted on the move knight takes c5 queen to d6 and now knight to b3 and these pawns are going to be pushed e4 Black pushes his own pawn majority, c5. Of course, this pawn isn't hanging because the queen is attacked. Queen to e5, queen to a4. Uh, knight f6, queen to d4, trying to exchange because these two pieces are going to be, uh, these two pawns are going to be much stronger than black's pawns. Of course, if f3, then gf3, bishop f3. Knight d7. It's really hard to, to blockade past pawns if you have two connected past pawns. That's another thing. Two connected past pawns are almost impossible to stop. And usually, if they are on the sixth or the third rank, they are considered to be a winning advantage. Uh, c6. Queen takes d4. Exchanging queens. Knight takes d4. Knight e5. Uh, now it's easier to blockade if black manages to get his pieces into this square. But c7. Bishop d7. Bishop b5 trying to exchange, bishop takes, rook takes, a6, now the advantage is already insurmountable, and uh, Sakaev went on to win. And just let me go through the moves quickly so that you can see what happened. Once again, he traded the advantage. So he does have two passed pawns, but he's going to trade them for, for a material advantage. And in this position, black decided to sacrifice a piece, which was the correct decision. A knight for two pawns, and uh, black traded a piece for two pawns. Now uh, white's advantage is much clearer. It's a piece up, and uh, he won. In fact, two moves later, black resigned. Here, black resigned. There's nothing he can do. So, okay, uh, let me come back to this position once more. Uh, queen a5, queen to d7. It's very important that you know ideas like this. Um, never look at your pawns as being a static entity. Try to imagine what would happen if these pawns weren't here. Try to imagine having these three pawns as past pawns. Because often, uh, especially in closed positions such as the Czech Benoni or the King's Indian or the Slav, you are often going to get a pawn break which will enable you uh, to, to create a dynamic pawn center on, or a dynamic pawn majority. And the move f4 is just brilliant here. I just love this move. And after e f4, e5, another pawn sacrifice. d5, knight c5. And here you have it, two connected past pawns. With a simple pawn sacrifice, white created a winning advantage. Uh, the third thing I would like to talk about is uh, trading pieces in a way which favors your pawn structure and creates a passed pawn. This is another uh, thing that's really hard to, to imagine if you don't know the examples. And this is something that you need to look for and look out for throughout your game. Uh, in this position, this is the game between, between Korchnoi and Karpov from Moscow, 1971, a very famous game. In this game, uh, Anatoly Karpov managed his past pawn so brilliantly. I think this is one of my favorite examples. And it all started with the move knight to d4. Now, this move is attacking the queen and double attacking the knight. There's really no easy way to defend everything. Uh, and uh, if white manages to defend, then he's trading off his uh, main defender of the king side, the light squared bishop. So in this position, Viktor Korchnoi decided to take the knight. And after knight takes d4, c takes d4, you have a passed pawn. Now, this pawn is almost run, rounded up, and it's not really clear whether the pawn is a liability or a strength, and it seems to be far, far, far away from queening. But look at what Anatoly Karpov did. Uh, knight to f3 by Korchnoi, queen b6, defending the pawn. 
knight e5, uh, indirectly attacking the pawn and attacking the bishop, because now uh, he is removing the defender, the g7 bishop. Bishop takes e5 has to be taken, bishop takes e5, f6, chasing the bishop away. Bishop f4, rook a c8, and I'm going to browse through the moves faster. This is a, a, critical, a critical idea, gaining a tempo on the rook, and now advancing his pawn. And now already, this pawn looks, uh, looks like a menace, and uh, this pawn on d3 now is very strong. And you could argue that it's already worth two pawns or even a minor piece. Uh, bishop to f1, trying to exchange the defender, and once again, if you are fighting against the passed pawn, either exchange its defenders or blockade the pawn. It would be ideal to blockade the pawn first and then exchange the defenders, for example, uh, putting your bishop here, but in this case it doesn't really work because the rook can attack. And now bishop takes f1, rook takes f1, rook to c2, bringing his rook to the second rank, preparing to double in some positions and then to push through with e2. Uh, bishop e3, knight c5, defending the pawn once more, queen d4, uh, double attacking the pawn and the knight, e5, chasing the queen away, Ampasan uh, works here, but now after queen takes e6, uh, everything is sufficiently defended, rook a to c1, rook c8, b4, chasing away the defender, knight takes e4, uh, rook takes c2, d takes c2, rook to c1, and here the pawn is blockaded, but one square away from promotion. And you can imagine what was going on in Viktor Korchnoi's head here. It's really hard to play with your opponent having a passed pawn on the second rank, and your whole thinking process uh, needs to revolve around this pawn, and on every move you are going to have to consider that. So having a passed pawn is a very huge advantage, and if you can, uh, if your opponent has a passed pawn, blockade it much sooner <laughs> than it comes to the to the second or the seventh rank. B6 here. Now Karpov realizes he has a huge and winning advantage, and he just plays it slowly, defending his a7 pawn. And I'm going to show you how the game ended here. Uh, Karpov uh, improved all of his pieces, and in this position, Viktor Korchny resigned. You can't take the pawn because the bishop is hanging, and the bishop doesn't really have any squares. If it gets, if it goes to d4, queen takes. If it goes to d7, queen takes, and everything is falling apart. Uh, and the last example is probably the most famous one. Uh, you probably know this game. Uh, this was played between Carlsen and, and Anand in their Sochi World Championship in Sochi, Russia 2014. And in this game, uh, this was the final game after which Magnus Carlsen won the World Championship. But Vichy Anand stood well, and uh, he is the one who, who I'm using for the last example. Uh, in this position, he played rook to b1, uh, rook to b8, I'm sorry with a clear uh, idea in mind. Uh, the last few moves were king to c6 and then king to f3, trying to get the king to, to e4, and the whole position uh, revolves around the d5 square and the d5 knight, whether it's sufficiently defended or not. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's it's a very complex game. You should, you should analyze it. And here, after uh, king to e4, we have rook to b4. And this is the last thing I would like to talk about. Often, you can sacrifice uh, in order to create a passed pawn, because as I said, a passed pawn isn't only worth one point. Once you create a passed pawn, it could be worth two, three, four, five, up to nine points, and often it's worth giving up an exchange or a piece or even a queen in some positions. Here, Magnus Carlsen can't really take with the knight, because if knight takes, then pawn takes, and uh, after the bishop moves, the c4 pawn is hanging. So after b4, rook b4, he needs to take with the bishop. And now uh, it was much better to take uh, with the a pawn because it opens up the rook and puts pressure on the a4 pawn. And, uh, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but anyway, Vishyanan took with the c pawn, which is a mistake. Uh, however, regardless of which pawn he takes with, this is a dangerous passed pawn, and Magnus Carlsen didn't really have an easy time rounding it up. And now the situation on the board changes, and Magnus Carlsen has to consider the passed pawn throughout the game. As I said, taking with the A pawn would have been better, and Vichy Anand might have even won the game, even though the position is not clear, but this, uh, this was a mistake. The rook sacrifice wasn't a mistake, taking with the C pawn was a mistake. The game continued, continued knight h5. I'm going to browse through the moves just to let you see what happened. Okay, exchanges, exchanges, and here, 
it's usually considered that having the bishop pair is a huge advantage and sometimes when your opponent has an exchange and the knight your bishop pair is even stronger than that so you could argue that uh, black's position isn't worse at all however the constellation of pieces makes it sort of uncomfortable and uh, Vichy is worse here but he does have a passed pawn bishop b5 a b5 king b5 e6 magnus has a passed pawn as well b3 king d3 and uh, two connected passed pawns and the game ended after king to c3 and it just doesn't work wish he couldn't do anything but uh, nevertheless uh, regardless of this position not working remember ideas like this and often if you have two two passed pawns uh, like this potentially defending the same square and if uh, a recapture by the pawn would create a passed pawn, so if, let's say, uh, a white pawn was on b3, then this wouldn't work. But since there are no pawns on the b-file, then an exchange sacrifice such as this one is very common, and it could win you games often. Uh, okay, these are the four ideas I wanted to talk about. I think they are very important to know and to look for during the game. The most important thing is that you think... Uh, about okay can i sacrifice my exchange now can i sacrifice a piece in order to create a passed pawn because if you don't think about it you're not going to spot it if you don't spot it then you're not going to play it and often these uh, sacrifices can be winning advantages the previous examples as well uh, try to think of ways to trade favorably uh, let's go back uh, okay let's go back to the original position before the passed pawn was created try to think of ways in which you can trade favorably and here the knight came from b5 to, to d4 and provoked a trade which created a passed pawn very often you can do that during a real game uh, example positions in which one side just has a pawn majority such as this one which looks pretty pretty strange for a, a strong grandmaster games to have happened happened uh, are going to are going to occur much uh, rarely and very often during the game you are going to have to create a passed pawn either by trading or by sacrificing and it's not going to be as simple as this but yeah look for patterns remember how how a passed pawn can be created remember that if you have it you have to push it if you play against it you have to blockade it and round it up and trade off the defenders if you have a passed pawn then it's usually favorable for, for you to trade pieces into an end game because it's going to be simpler to win uh, okay, thanks very much for watching. I hope you liked this middle game ideas video on the past pawns. Please do let me know what you think. Uh, let me know how you cope or promote your past pawns and uh, stay tuned for more chess. Thanks very much. Bye bye.